Well, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this seminar. Is everybody enjoying their stay so far? Steve? Dave? You guys aren't, aren't real excited. Come on. We're the sponsoring entity. We've got to, we've got to show enthusiasm. No. Hey, I, they're here. There we go. I would like to introduce to you Randy Durr. Those of you who are familiar with his work understand why this is a special seminar. And he's going to be talking about scratch building and uncommon uses of common material. And all of us at some point, after listening to Jim yesterday talk about scratch building, and I don't care which method you use, we all go through it. And he's here to give us some information. And just looking at what his collection is up here, I can see exactly pro uh, projects and uh, items that I can personally use. We're really looking forward to this seminar. This is brought to you by the Moonlight Model Club from Arizona. And if you know anybody from one of these clubs, I want you to say thank you. And they help sponsor it and, and uh, help put it on because I, I don't know about you, but I, I go out of here with my brain numb with all the great information and it's part of the, some of the best things about GSL. So make sure that when you talk, you raise your hand first and speak distinctly because JJ will jump up and down on you if he doesn't get good sound bites. What's that? That's why they raise their hand. So you can handle the microphone. Without further ado, Randy, it's up to you. Thank you, Brian. Hey, uh, actually, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Brian, Mark, and his crew for what a great job they're doing here at the show. I hope everyone's having a great time as I am. So I'd like to give them a hand, first of all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, when Mark first asked me to uh, give a presentation or seminar here at uh, GSL, I jumped at the chance because I always like to get out and meet new people and, and share the ideas because really that's the biggest part of uh, these kind of uh, meets and contests is uh, gathering new ideas and sharing ideas. And uh, so with that, we'll get into things. Um, actually, he asked me to do something on scratch building. And go ahead and to the next slide, please. And at first I thought, well, I know what scratch building is, but maybe I don't. So I went to, I was going to go to the dictionary, but I figured it's not in there. So I went to Wikipedia and found this really great definition. Uh, scratch building process a building scale model from raw materials rather than building it from a commercial kit or kit bashing or buying it pre-assembled. thought, that's not a bad definition, but it seems maybe a little bit too restrictive. Now perhaps, maybe your idea or your definition of scratch building is more like this. Take a resin body, some sheet plastic, some kit parts, an acrylic rod, and you build a replica of the Hugo Zucchini human cannonball truck. Now, to me, that's a form of scratch building. I don't know if it fits the Wikipedia definition, but to me, that's scratch building. Or maybe you take this somewhat obscure but not totally inaccurate toy, you add some sheet plastic, some brass, some custom-made decals, and you end with this replica of the uh, Budweiser GTP Corvette. That's another form of scratch building. Or maybe this is more your style. A bunch of styrene rod and tubing, some sheet plastic, you build a basic chassis, add a bunch of other details to uh, finish out the, uh, the rolling chassis itself, combine it with uh, some sheet plastic to modify a kit body, and you end up with a replica of the Motocraft uh, Trans Am Capri. So there's all kinds of definitions for scratch building, or perhaps you're one of those one percenters out there, also known as the lunatic fringe, <laughs> who take a whole bunch of brass, make a chassis, add a bunch of other resin parts and custom cast uh, pieces, photo etch, some hand-formed brass panels, and you end up with this uh, something like this 112 scale sprint car replica. Uh, that's to be continued, because that one's not, not quite done. But I think to best explain my topic for today, I need to go back to my model building roots. So if you would, here's some photographic uh, evidence of the, my early years in model building. Like many of you, I expect I began model building in the early mid-60s. 
And my model building, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Iowa, and my only contact with the outside model building world was that monthly issue of Model Car Science Magazine. And so a lot of what I built was influenced by that, as well as the real cars that I had exposure to. And again, out there in Iowa, I had a lot of exposure to stock cars at the various dirt tracks, and uh, what I read about in the magazine, like the uh, Root Beer Baron. Does anybody remember the Root Beer Baron project? That one really, really hit me, and I had to build that one. And then you have to do something with the leftover parts, and so you do that. And of course, who didn't have a big T in their day? Or then, really, the 12-scale the Lotus up there in the corner was kind of a pivotal model for me. It was a Christmas present, as I remember. But I think, honestly, that's what's got me on this 12-scale path. Because if you know the Tamara kits, they were just tremendously detailed compared to anything else out there. And I think that detail and that realism really stuck with me. And so I think that's how it all started. But like I said, I was influenced by the cars I was exposed to, be it the stock cars or whatever. And when I was about 10 years old, my dad took me to the Can-Am races up in Wisconsin. And if you remember the Can-Am series, it was a road racing series where there weren't any really great uh, set of rules. It was horsepower and a little bit of early aerodynamics and big tires. And these cars went very fast and really tore up the track. And so as a youth, I wanted to build a model of a Can-Am car. So while the Lotus met its demise and contributed some parts, if you would, please. And here it was. This is the humble beginnings of a scratch builder. This was my first Can-Am car, probably 12, 13 years old at the time I built it, maybe 14, something like that. And using the materials on hand, which meant the body was actually cardboard, covered with contact paper. So we were not exactly on the cutting edge of scratch building with those materials. But as I kept thinking about the next car to build and what I was going to do, the need for some better materials arose. And one day at my, uh, my job after school at the uh, local Five and Dime, I came across this wondrous discovery, sheet plastic, big sheets of 40,000 styrene that kept all the records separate in the record department. And these would get circulated in and out quite readily because, well, if you recognize some of those artists, they kind of came and went. And it's kind of an eclectic co collection of artists there. But uh, these would get dirty, they'd get worn. But they were a, a fabulous source of scratch building plastic for my projects. Because at the time, even if you went to Auto World, I think the biggest piece of plastic you could buy was like four by five or something, really tiny. And of course, a 12 scale Can Am car took a lot of plastic. So that discovery led to this. This was a uh, pretty much scratch built uh, 12 scale Can Am car of my own design. The tub, the body was all that sheet plastic, the wing as well. The wheels and tires and the engine came from a uh, Tamiya Ferrari kit at the time. And this one then led to the next in the series. Also 112 scale, used some of the Terrell parts for the uh, drivetrain. And uh, these were all kind of around my uh, middle to later years of high school when I was building these. But uh, then this one led to the last in the series. This was more of an endurance racer. But again, all these cars used that sheet plastic that I discovered. And it was just such a uh, fabulous material, if you would, that that kind of started how I did scratch building. It was more a matter of necessity than anything, but it got me improvising as to what are the materials I could use to scratch build parts or entire bodies or chassis or whatever. And over the years, it's led me into some places to look for materials that you wouldn't typically think you'd find model building materials in. But, uh, and even my wife now has gotten in on the, on the uh, whole deal because oftentimes she'll ask me, hey, can you use this on your models? And so therefore, welcome to Uncommon Uses for Common Materials in Model Building. Oh, but first, the fine print. Is that too fine? <laughs> All right, maybe go to the next one then. While many of these ideas are original ideas of my own, many are not. And I apologize in advance for any borrowed ideas used without giving proper credit. But really, I can't even remember where they all came from anymore. And uh, so they're presented really as a collection of my favorites. And I, uh, I, there's a lot of them that I use quite regularly. And I hope you will enjoy them too. 
So with that, go on to the first one here. This one I discovered oh, about 25 years ago in the, uh, in the roofing department of your hardware store or home improvement store, you'll find thin aluminum flashing. And it's a nicely brushed finish. It's got a, a clear polish to it. Uh, it's fairly stiff. And what you can do, if you would please, next one, you can scribe it with a, uh, an old X-Acto blade and this, using a straight edge. And then you can bend it back and forth and snap it just like you would sheet plastic to make your cuts. Uh, next one, please. Or if you scribe it lightly and fold it over a sharp edge of a countertop or something, you can make bends, file or drill notches or holes into it. And it will work out really great to build interior panels for race cars or street rods or any number of, of uses. And this is from my Trans Am car of the early 80s. Uh, also, if you would, use it in that, uh, that Capri we looked at earlier. The entire interior is made out of that aluminum. And on my most recent Ford car, it's uh, the air dam and the spoiler. It really works anywhere you need a very stiff, rigid aluminum, but still wants something fairly easy to work with. So while we're on the subject of aluminum, also in the, uh, in the hardware store, the home improvement store, is a material I call furnace tape. It's an aluminum tape, sticky back. It has a paper backing, like a, a smooth paper backing that it's applied to. And it works really well to replicate hose clamps. Apologize for the uh, picture, not a very good picture. But anywhere you need a little strap or a clamp or something like that, you just cut a slice of that out and it can apply it. Or my best uh, use of that, my favorite is, and this is a Jim Drew idea. I'll give credit for this one. Uh, you take a Pentel pencil and the little steel sheath that protects the lead. You sharpen that on the outside, bevel that on the outside to sharpen it. And you can also do this with the tubing, but the Pentel has a little bit uh, added feature that helps. But you sharpen that end, and you use that as a punch to punch out little discs of this uh, aluminum tape. And then you advance the lead to eject the rivet, the, the rivet head now, onto the surface you want. And if you would please, to make scale rivets. And if you sharpen the lead, if you point the lead, you'll get the little dimple in the middle like a pop rivet. If you blunt the lead, you'll just get a flat rivet. You can actually replace the lead with brass rod and sharpen it to a blade and make like a straight screwdriver head, or straight, straight uh, blade screwdriver head. Uh, Pentels come in a lot of different sizes. I happen to have a .3. This is a .5 and a .7. They make all the different sizes. I think they come in a .9, but I just don't have one. Yep, thanks, Dave. And uh, this, this idea of gyms I've used uh, hundreds of times, and I consider it to be almost one of the, the best scratch building detail ideas in, in my building out there. And I'm glad he shared that one with us. Uh, yep, there you go. Uh, now, I also, I talked about going into different stores and different places looking for things. The fabric store I find to be an interesting place to visit. And I happened to upon these uh, iron-on rhinestones and studs. And they work really well, please, to make baby moon hubcaps. They're a nice polished, smooth surface. They're very inexpensive. You can uh, buy a sheet of them for a few bucks, and you got enough for several projects. Also, while you're in the fabric store, ribbon. Of course, it comes in a number of different colors, widths, textures, whatever. I use this yellow ribbon to make hold down straps for the uh, Porta Johns on this uh, Johnny on the Spot truck that I built. Add some uh, aluminum wire for the hooks and some, make some buckles for the tensioners. And give it a little bit of weathering with a, a dark wash and you've got some nice uh, uh, tie down, not on tie down straps. While you're in the uh, fabric store or the craft store, there's this material called uh, beading wire. And it's like a fine uh, cable which just, or, or while you're in the uh, sporting goods store, they also sell these fishing wire leaders, also cable. And those, either or any of those, work for the, uh, a cable for like a work truck or something, uh, for a, a crane or a derrick or something of that nature. And this one I haven't even weathered yet. I just put it together with some aluminum clamps on the end, and you've got a, a nice piece of cabling there. Uh, tire inner tube. What in the world would you use a bicycle tire inner tube for? Well, it's a great source of thin rubber to use for mud flaps. Or I also punch discs out of it and use it for the dust boots in uh, working steering linkage. 
when you sharpen a piece of uh, like KNS brass tubing and you use it to punch out the rubber, you'll get that tapered that tapered cross section. Punch or drill a hole. Oh, sorry, if you would please go back. Punch or drill a hole in the center, and then when you bolt this joint together, that gives you enough play and that allows the motion of the joint. Uh, and it looks like the uh, tapered dust boots on uh, on suspension and steering linkages. Next one, please. Pastel chalks, you can get them in all different colors, all different types. You don't uh, have to spend a lot of money. Some are very cheap, some are a little bit more expensive. They work really well to shave a little bit of them off uh, with your exact knife into a, into a cup. And I use them for weathering. Uh, add a little depth and color to tire tread, for example. Just apply it with an old uh, paintbrush. I also use it on exhaust systems. It, uh, it works really nice on flat paints because it sticks in the pores of the paint and it gives you that slightly used appearance. You know, oftentimes, I've always thought my models were just not realistic because they were like just newly built and too clean, so to speak, too shiny, especially for race cars, which I build a lot of. So you, you dust some of that around in all the normal areas where brake dust would gather in the wheel wells or tire rubber would gather, and it, uh, it works very well. Also, uh, I use it, next one please, in the uh, areas where the exhaust would collectors come together where you're always notorious for having leaks there, especially on race cars, and so you do a little bit of that weathering there. So uh, while we're on the subject of weathering, uh, a lot of you guys build cars that need rust or corrosion, and I take a piece of steel wool, soak it in some salt water, and just leave that next to the workbench, and you've got a ready supply of rusty wash. You just can put it on with an old brush or a Q-tip or whatever, and it, I mean, it looks like rust because it is. And you gotta have the salt though. It, it uh, you know, hastens the, the corrosion process, and you get a little bit better yield for your uh, for your time. Tissues. Well, we know a lot of different uses in everyday life for for regular tissue, but we use them oftentimes for like a tonneau cover for this uh, Cobra sports car. Cover the area that you want to make a tonneau cover with saran wrap or clear plastic food wrap. Tape it down, stretch it out so it's nice and smooth. Take a piece of the tissue and some white glue and water mix and basically like paper mache, just, just spread that out, get it all nice and smooth, get out all the air bubbles, get out all the wrinkles, let that dry, and then you can just peel it right off of that plastic wrap, add some rivet detail, paint it black or whatever color you want, and you've got a real nice two-scale uh, tonneau cover looks like canvas. If you shop around, the tissues come in a lot of different thicknesses and textures and weaves, and so you can find something that'll fit uh, your particular application really nice. Filter hose washers. Found those at uh, the, the home improvement store the other day, and they're just a rubber gasket with a wire screen. You can cut that screen out, flatten it out, and cut out discs that make the, uh, the nice mesh screen that they use in the old drag cars for the air intakes, uh, also maybe for stock car intakes or something like that. Uh, while I was with my wife in, uh, in a cake decorating store, she does a lot of that, I found this silver foil made by Wilton and just had to have it because it has this really neat texture. Go ahead. It's got this nice waffle texture and it makes perfect heat shield insulation foil. Now in this case, I didn't add enough weathering, but you can give it different washes of blue or kind of a brown gold or a black wash to give it that uh, heated look. But uh, it works really well for heat insulation and that whole roll is probably a lifetime supply for 10 of us out here, you know, in terms of there's a lot of square inches on that roll. Solder. Of course, we've talked a lot about solder this uh, weekend in terms of joining brass pieces together and making parts, but I have a lot of other uses for solder, such as exhaust pipes. It's my favorite material for making exhaust headers because it forms easily, and when you got them all installed in the engine and you now you got to load that engine into the engine compartment, they give a little. You can bend them out of the way to get that engine in and then put them back the way you had them formed. And it comes in a number of different sizes. Uh, one caution is I would suggest you use solid core solder if you can find it. I made the mistake of using rosin core solder on a car, and it got a little warm, and the headers leaked 
the rosin. But there's a way to fix that too. If you can only find rosin core in the size you want, when you cut all the individual pieces to make the headers, just drill the ends and plug them with uh, some super glue, and that'll keep that, that rosin inside the center. Because sometimes you're looking for a particular diameter for a particular header pipe, and you may need to use a rosin core because that's all you can find. But all these exhaust headers were made that way. Also, the tailpipe for the mini there, that was made out of a piece of solder. And again, when you, you can polish it up or paint it, whatever uh, suits your, uh, your need. I also use it for um, radiator hose. Again, because it forms so easily, and then you can just paint it black and add some clamps. And on uh, the bigger scale, some of the smaller uh, 15 thousandths uh, solder that I find at Radio Shack works very well for plug wires. You paint it with some acrylic paint to get the color you want, and it will take the form just the way you want it to get it to drape just right on the engine, and then it'll hold that form. Oftentimes, insulated wire just looks too much like insulated wire, and it doesn't really look like plug wires because it just doesn't lay quite right. So that's another usage for, uh, for solder. Uh, back to the craft store. I happened upon these uh, googly eyes and uh, found that they make really great headlight lenses. You cut the back off, throw away the little beady eye inside, make some new uh, bulbs and reflectors out of aluminum or plastic, painted chrome or whatever, and then this is your new uh, headlight lens. And they come in a whole number of different sizes and and types as well. Uh, still at the uh, craft store, back to some, uh, some ribbon. This is a woven ribbon. It's actually quite wide. Oftentimes it has a real fine wire running along each edge. Well, that works very well to make the uh, mud screen or the dirt screen for the front of race car. It actually is more correct to scale because of the fine uh, filaments that they use for the ribbon and the fine weave that they use for the ribbon. And you can find it in, in different colors. Silver is often uh, readily available because they use it for silver anniversary decorations. And so you don't even need to paint it to make uh, the screens here. And then I also have some of it in the headlight uh, openings there. Back to the uh, fishing department again. And there's a nylon leader wire. It comes in a few colors. Usually clear and black are the two that I've found to be the most useful. But the clear works really well, if you would please, for the uh, fuel lines in the engine compartment. A lot of uh, cars oftentimes would have clear plastic uh, fuel lines, and so it works very well for that. Uh, next, uh, chrome mylar tape. Now this I found at an auto parts store, and it was called bumper repair tape. Because what you did was when your bumper started rusting, you'd buy this and just stick that over the rust, and it fixed your bumper up. But what I use it for, is I punch out discs and it makes excellent mirror glass because it's stiff enough that it won't wrinkle when you punch it out and place it in place. It's very highly reflective and it just makes wonderful uh, mirror glass. I also cut it into strips and add some of those rivets that we talked about earlier and it makes great skid rails for the inside of a, of a street rod truck. While we're on the subject of tape, Plain old athletic tape. This is just the cloth tape that you'll find in a uh, drugstore anywhere. Works very well to be the uh, asbestos insulation found in some of the older race cars. This particular project, uh, as I was working along, this was going to be the hardest part of the project, I thought, was coming up with the material that would conform to the floorboards, look like the, the real coarse canvas weave of that heat insulation blanket. And I, I found that tape put some uh, pieces of it on a piece of plastic, painted it silver, and found that it, once it had dried a little bit, you could just thumb it right to the, uh, to the floorboards. It would allow the, the detail of the floorboards to show through, as well as the, uh, the seams would just disappear if you butted it right up against itself. And it just works really well for uh, something like that. Uh, this is uh, pressure sensitive nylon that I found at, uh, I think, Hobby Lobby is the place I located this. And it's a real thin nylon with an adhesive back. Comes in four colors, blue, white, red, and black. Makes great seat belts. It has the proper weave. It's thin enough to form. It'll go through photo etch buckles. And then you just double it over on itself. And the self-adhesive sides join each other. And, and it holds it together. Uh, again, while we're on tape, uh, found this. Uh, 
what I call paper tape, and they can't even decide what to call it. They call it durable cloth tape here and genuine paper there. But whatever you call it, it's a nice thin paper tape, and you take uh, a rod of the right size, some thin wire, wrap a coil spring of wire, wrap the tape around that like uh, you know, cigarette paper would roll, and then you slide it off, paint it up, and you end up with uh, brake cooling ducts. It's nice and flexible. You can make them any size you want. If you go back one slide, please. This one actually I used in an 80s uh, IMSA car, and the tubing they used on that car was that orange color, and it had like a chrome filament wound around it uh, that I think was a spring within the, in the uh, ducting itself. I duplicated that by uh, taking some silver thread and unbraiding the three strands and using one of those strands wrapped around in between the coils to, uh, to form that. But again, go forward. It, these are flexible enough. I've actually used them on models with posable steering where they connect to the, uh, to the wheel backing plate and they will move with the posable steering. Uh, wire from an old slot car motor. You unwind the armature. It's a real fine wire. Take however many of those you need, three, four, five together, and you, you twist them all together. And then you paint it black up to where they start coming apart. And then you paint each of those a different color, and it makes an excellent scale wiring harness. The black paint replicates the tape wrap of the harness. And then the individual colors, of course, represent the individual uh, wires. It works. In any scale, this particular one is the 12th scale, but I've also used it in 24th, 25th scale. You just got to find a little finer wire to make it uh, look realistic. And you can do really the entire wiring harness if you're so inclined. Uh, guitar strings. I was looking for a source for some very fine spring wire and found that guitar strings, I'm not a guitar player, so I wasn't aware of this, but they go clear down to eight thousandths of an inch, which let me think about that. In scale, is uh, pretty darn small. Anyway, uh, if you go forward, uh, I used it to bend uh, the hood pins, the, the hood latch pins. I've also used it to make uh, torsion springs to hold trunk lids open. And it, the ten thousandths, the nine thousandths, the eight thousandths are all really good uh, sizes for 24 scale, 25th scale for different uh, different usages. And the wire wrap wires, the wire wound guitar strings, excuse me. Uh, you can separate off that wire wound part off of the core and makes great throttle return springs. You can cut it to whatever length you need, stretch it out to the right pitch, whatever you need to do. Next one, please. Uh, and I know a lot of people probably use guitar string for radio antennas, but I'm not into body piercing. Wow. And so I use the bristles from an old toothbrush because they're nice and readily available. Well, more than a lifetime supply in one brush. They're nice and flexible. If they get damaged, you can just replace it easy enough. And I hope even at a show, you'll have your toothbrush with you if it's an overnighter. And uh, a whole lot safer when you're picking up the model and transporting it. And so I've gone to using those instead of the music wire for uh, radio antennas. Uh, there's something, it's either, you can find it in the uh, beading section of a hobby store, a craft store, or back to the fishing department or the sports store, and it's braided nylon line or braided silk pennant cord or whatever you want to call it, and it forms the old vintage uh, hydraulic lines for older, older race cars. They used a cloth wrapped uh, hydraulic line instead of the new stainless steel wrapped hydraulic lines. So you can use it for the oil lines, for the brake lines. Works very well on those old vintage cars. Ping pong balls. Now, where would you use those on a model? Well, they're a great source for a real thin styrene plastic. You can punch out discs. They make the nice domed headlight covers. Or I've used them for the ends of an air tank, for an air compressor, or a fuel tank. Uh, I take a piece of uh, brass tubing of the right size, sharpen the end of it, either on the ID or the OD to get the size I want, and then just punch out discs uh, out of the uh, ping pong ball. Paint them up, and you've got nice domed covers. Nylon netting, back to the fabric store here. Uh, I've found that to be a great source for, and it comes out of different sizes. Go ahead. Great source for window netting, especially the cars of the 80s had window netting that was more of this style rather than the big thick bands. You just edge it with some, uh, some crepe tape or some masking tape, paint it up, and it makes a great uh, scale window net. 
It comes in a number of different sizes, if you would please. So you can use it for 24 scale, 143rd scale. Uh, the little 43rd scale I actually picked up at a wedding because they had used it to wrap the rice to throw at the bride and the groom. So I picked up a few squares of that and I've got a whole big supply of 43rd scale window netting now, if you need some. Window netting, this is actually window screen that you buy at the hardware store that you do for your screen doors or your windows in your house. It used to be wire, but nowadays, like many things, it's made out of plastic, which works to our advantage. It makes a great mud screen for those old vintage race cars. It's got a, a nice square weave, so it looks like that old wire screen they used in those days. You can cut it easily, attach it with some of those chrome tape strips we talked about earlier, and you've got a mud screen. Egg cartons, foam cartons that food comes in, you get a piece of that, cut out a piece of it. It has a nice porosity to it. You paint it up with some acrylic paints, you've got to use acrylics, and it makes the foam gaskets around air cleaners, or you could use it for the air cleaner on them itself, uh, wherever you need a foam gasket. It uh, just has that right look of the, of the foam once you get it painted up. Uh, electrical tape. I just use black electrical tape to make uh, air dam skirts. Again, some rivet detail to them. The tape, the vinyl tape, usually comes in black for electrical purposes, but you can find it in many different colors to fit uh, whatever your need is for your car. Uh, back on solder again, but actually I use it as a core within a piece of heat shrink tubing. Take a length of heat shrink tubing, carefully shrink it, because you don't want to melt the solder, and it forms some nice radiator hoses. With the solder inside, you can bend it to shape. The heat shrink just has the right look to it, to my eye. And again, some, some aluminum tape straps, hose clamps to it, and you've got uh, some radiator hoses. I also slit it and apply it to roll cages. It works out really nice for scale uh, roll cage padding. And it comes in different uh, finishes, I'll say. Some are real shiny. Some of it uh, that you can find for more commercial applications is, is more the, the pebbly dull texture, so it looks more like the real uh, padding. <coughs> this is a uh, frying pan splatter screen. You can buy a, a single one, or you can buy a set of two or three at uh, like a Walmart or anywhere that sells that kind of stuff. And I use that for mud screen. Or you can also use it for uh, the decking, like on a, uh, on a trailer. For the, it, they apply it to the ramps for traction. It's the expanded metal. It uh, really, it's made out of aluminum, so you can cut it easily with a pair of scissors. You can paint it whatever color you need, and it makes a real nice expanded wire, uh, metal mesh surface. This is uh, Mylar trim. It's uh, made by Monocoat. I find it in RC airplane shops. It's not the Monocoat itself, because that's a heat uh, sensitive product, but this is the trim that's used for stripes and numbers and whatnot, and it's self-adhesive. It's very thin mylar, comes in a rainbow of colors, and I use it for a lot of different things. I use it for striping. All those red stripes on that car were made out of the uh, Monaco trim. The black stripes on the Trans Am were the same way. Cut it into real fine strips and use it for the welting on these old English uh, sports cars. I uh, also use it for the uh, window retaining straps, or in the case of the Comet down there, uh, made a nice uh, pinstripe out of it. Uh, again, all the colors that you can choose uh, works to whatever your project is. To cut real fine uh, strips like that, what I have done is taken an X-Acto knife and modified the collet to hold two blades side by side. And then you can put a piece of shim stock in between the two blades and you can spread it or narrow it down to whatever width you need. And then you can just follow your template and you will get a, a perfect width stripe of any shape you want. Uh, if you happen upon Radio Shack, they sell these little electrical components, diodes, uh, resistors, whatnot. They're leaded components. They got a little soft wire coming out of each end. You can paint them up, add some fittings to them, and they make great uh, fuel filters. The, the wire out of each end is typically long enough to go from the carburetor to the fuel pump on a, on a typical engine, and so you've got a ready-made fuel filter. I uh, think this was talked about a little bit yesterday, but uh, all the different paints that are available, the suede paint, I know we mentioned yesterday, but also I found this uh, shoe or leather dye. Uh, Duplicolor makes a vinyl or fabric paint. Uh, I pick up those cans whenever I have a need or see a different color or shade, and I use those for interior parts because 
to my eye, the vinyl paint looks like the vinyl in the car interiors. Whereas the model paints, it's a lot harder to work at getting the right sheen oftentimes. Whereas this just right out of the can gives you the, that, that vinyl sheen that you're looking for. And the shoe dye comes in a whole bunch of different colors. Uh, I show brown and black here, but it's reds and blues and yellows and, and you name it really for any project you might have. Uh, drinking straws, we're all familiar with the big corrugated drinking straws, but for the, uh, the juice boxes have a little bit smaller diameter straw. And I've used those to make the, uh, the corrugated uh, radiator hose. Just can paint them with some acrylic paint and add, them, add some clamps to each end and they make a great, uh, a great uh, radiator hose. Uh, happened upon this, don't ask me why I was in the hair supply salon store. I'll explain it later. But found this nail striping tape there and it's ready-made 15 thousandths wide chrome tape. So now you've got your hose clamps or your straps or anything you need just right on a roll for three dollars. You get uh, 100 inches I guess that is maybe and uh, works just great. You don't have to bother cutting uh, the mylar if you don't want to. You're already in the store, right? So you might as well stay and look around. <laughs> and I found these nice squirt bottles. They work well in your paint booth to hold the uh, thinners because uh, typically they're, they're meant to carry some, some pretty serious hair dye chemicals so they can handle lacquer thinner or, or water or any of the acrylic thinners. And so they're just convenient to have right there at your paint booth. But also just the whole selection of nail boards. Now I know you can buy sanding sticks, but I find the nail boards to be a lot less expensive, a lot more readily available, and just a whole different host of grits and types. The one there on top, the, the red and blue kiss one, is, is my favorite because it starts with uh, a fairly coarse blue, then you go to red, and then you flip it over, and there's a gray and a white on the other side. And if you work through those four grits, you can make plastic shine like it's been clear coated almost, because it, it works all the way up to the, those really fine grits. The one at the top there, the black one with the gray handle, is one I recently discovered that actually has self-adhesive uh, sanding pieces that are, are replaceable. So you get one handle and a whole pack of replacement uh, grit strips that you can just replace when they get uh, worn out. I also have uh, cut these into different widths and shapes to get into different areas when you're trying to file in between tubes on a frame or, or something of that nature. And again, they come in all different kinds of, of grit types and uh, just experiment with them. I think you'll find them to be uh, pretty cool. Aluminum pans. This is uh, another one of my favorite uh, uses for scratch building materials. You can buy them at, uh, at the cooking aisle of your grocery store or in any of the, the Walmart type stores. They come in different thicknesses, different tempers. Some are very ductile, some are very rigid. Uh, you can find them in black. I use these to make interior blank off panels. You can cut them with a knife, cut them with the scissors, add a few of those populated uh, details, and you've got some nice, easy to uh, build blank off panels. Uh, I also used uh, some of it to, to do the aluminum trim on the freight car. It can be punched to make the uh, holes, the ventilation holes. Again, add some rivet detail to it. It forms really nice to the shape. I also have used it for heat shields, uh, light blank off panels, uh, fender extensions, taillight blank off panels. It's uh, again, depending on what look you're after, it comes in a whole bunch of different thicknesses and, and, and uh, stiffnesses. It, it has a lot of different uh, applications. Now if you need to do bead rolling and you want to make the same look side to side on the car, what I do is I take a piece of plastic up there in, in picture number one and you cut the shape that you want the bead rolling pattern to be. And then drill a couple extra holes off the side of the template. Then you make a base, and I hope this shows up, but the base is just a thick piece of plastic with two posts that match those two holes. Then you put your template on the base, and I take a cross stitch needle, which is not a sharp pointed needle, but more of a rounded tip needle, in a pin vise, and I just trace around and around and around that template until I form a groove in the base plate. And is that visible? Can people see that? So you get this groove that you can kind of clean up with some, uh, some steel wool or some uh, uh, sanding pad. And then, once you have that, you take a piece of your aluminum, you slide it in between the template and the base plate, sharpen a, uh, a orange wood uh, cuticle stick, 
and you just work around your template and you form your bead rolling. Flip it over and you get your raised bead on the other side. And then you can just do multiples if you've got left side, right side panels that are the same. In the case of the Foyt car, that rear panel was the same but mirror image. So what I did, next slide please, is I cut one template, but I made my base plate twice as wide and you take the template this way and, and do one pattern and then you just flip it over and do the other pattern. So now your base plate has two sets of grooves and you just flip your template back and forth and you get a left hand and a right hand. And now finally, this is an oldie but a goodie and I include it as a tribute to Don Emmons. All of you I think probably remember Don Emmons and his detail for real articles probably had as much influence on the way I build models as anything over the years. Because when you'd pick up that magazine and you'd look and you go, that's a nice model, that's a nice model, that's a nice model, and then you'd look at Don's work and you go, that's a nice replica of a car. And it, it just was totally different. So I include this. He had the use of map pins for, of course, shifter knobs, but I also use them to make ball joints, working ball joints. The plastic headed map pins, you can pull the head off of the pin, drill out the hole for a jewelry screw. You draw a blind hole in the control arm to make a socket to accept that, that ball end, and you run the screw up through that, through one of the rubber boots into the uh, spindle, and you've got a working ball joint. So, how do you define scratch building? Perhaps like this, where you modify a kit, make some, some scratch built lifter, some port johns or maybe like this, where you go all out and scratch build every piece of the car. Well, really? Go ahead. Any way you define it's okay, as long as you're improving your skills and having fun because, after all, this is supposed to be a hobby, right? All right. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, thank you. I have uh, a lot of those materials up here at the uh, table. If you want, we can spend a few moments. I can show you some of them if you have an interest. And again, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the uh, rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.